everybody and welcome to Digital VLSI Design, a course that's given at Bar Ilan University in the Faculty of Engineering. I'm Dr. Adam Tiemann and this is a course I've developed over the last few years and I wanted to share it with you and so I'm recording it. A few things before we start. I'm a member of NX Labs at Bar Ilan University. NX is the Emerging Nanoscaled Integrated Circuits and Systems Labs. Here's a picture of uh, our faculty. Um, that's a very beautiful faculty in Ramat Gan, Israel. And we're part of uh, the Electrical Engineering Department in the Nanoelectronics track. And our labs are called edX. And one of the things that we are doing, we're educating the future of chip design in Israel. Um, we're also doing some great research, so if you're interested in knowing about it, drop me an email and I will tell you about it. So we're going to start with our introduction lecture to this course. And here's a bit about the, the outline. We'll start with motivation, then we'll go over a bit about building a chip, we'll discuss some of the basics of design automation, and we'll finish this introductory lecture with an overview of the chip design flow. So we'll start with motivation and introduction. What is the motivation behind this course? So what you see here is the uh, patent for the integrated circuit that came out in 1964. Um, the integrated circuit, which is maybe in some uh, areas of pop culture less known than, than the invention of the transistor is one of the most important inventions of, uh, of our time and maybe of history and maybe just as important as the transistor. It was the ability to actually put several devices on one monolithic substrate and it led the way to computers as we know them today. The next step that I just wanted to point out in kind of motivation came in 1971, and that's when Intel broke out, um, making this chip, the Intel 4004, which was the first monolithic microprocessor, when they put 2,300 transistors on one chip and created a whole microprocessor that was on one single substrate. So as you see, in the few years that passed from the invention of the integrated circuit, they were already able to go three orders of magnitude higher in the amount of um, of, uh, of functionality they could put on the chip if uh, one transistor is functionality. Intel, of course, has led the way for a long time in this, uh, in, in this field. And in 1992, the Intel 486DX2 was the first or one of the first um, processors to have more than a million transistors integrated on a single die. So you see, again, we went three orders of magnitude higher from a thousand transistors to a million. And of course, We've long surpassed that level of a billion transistors, and here in 2006, Intel put out the Itanium 2 Montecito processor with 1.7 billion transistors. So you see there's been a lot of advance and progress in this field, and the integration of transistors has grown exponentially according to Moore's law. If we go to a more modern processor, you here have the Core i7-6950X Extreme Edition, or also known as the Broadwell E architecture. And you see this is a very, very big chip with a lot of stuff going on. Um, you can see here in the middle uh, a bit of the architecture of, uh, uh, of the chip, uh, some of the block diagrams that discuss how it uh, works. And we see different uh, data here in, in, that I collected here in this table on the right. So this was introduced in 2016, and it's already in a 14 nanometer FinFET process. That's a three-dimensional process, 14 nanometers. That's really, really small, way smaller than anyone ever would have um, dreamt of a long time ago. It has a lot of memory on it, reaching 25 megabytes in the L3 cache. And uh, it has 10 cores on, on the chip. It can run 20 threads in parallel. It runs at a frequency of a few gigahertz, and it has a 246 millimeter die size. That's pretty big. Um, it, this chip has over 3.2 billion transistors on it from, uh, from data I was able to find. So you see, this is a big monster. But there is a problem. As you can see in this graph, uh, this is kind of a uh, type of graph that is shown in different places and you see that we have plotted two things um, on the bottom we have the year um, where we have one scale on the right is the productivity which is how many transistors uh, or theoretical transistors each staff each engineer can deal with and you see that has grown exponentially because this is a logarithmic graph but on the left here we have the logic uh, transistors per chip, according to Moore's law, which has also grown on an exponent. 
the only thing is that you see that the uh, scale of the growth on uh, on the logic transistors per chip is much larger than the productivity of how much a person can deal with even with uh, the different tools that we, we use to to help us grow this exponentially and this has caused a gap to um, to come along and uh, this has been known and called Moore's Law of Engineers. So one of the things that we're going to discuss and motivation for this course is how we can go and close this gap or what we can do with all of these transistors that we're putting on the chip. Um, just another piece of there, if we are talking about those big chips and, and so forth, we can take a, a theoretical system on a chip here and here's a block diagram of what could be, for example, a system on chip that's inside a cell phone. And you see you have all these different blocks that do different things, right? You have some uh, video codec that can take our input from our camera and compress it. You have a Bluetooth uh, piece here and a GPS piece here, which also has an RF that talks to, uh, that, that gets the reception of the GPS. We have another RF block that does our communication. We have some analog blocks. We have clocking. We have audio, for example, talking to the microphone and playing in our, uh, in our speaker. We have the screen, maybe some sort of keyboard or other input, power management, and so forth. We have all these different things. They can all be integrated on one chip, and that's really, really complicated. So how on earth should we design such a thing? So the solution I've divided into three categories, and those three categories are as such. First, we start with design abstraction. If we abstract away each part of our, um, our design, of our engineering uh, task, and each factor in, in, the, in, in uh, each engineer or each team of engineers is, specializes in one part of it, but can get inputs from other engineers, can give outputs to other engineers, we can specialize in our one part, do it the best we can, and uh, we can deal with a bigger problem by connecting all of those different abstractions together. So design abstraction is one key to solving such a problem. Our second key to solving this problem is known as design automation. In each part of dealing with these mini, mini, mini transistors and this very uh, difficult functionality, we need to make automation. We need to use our computers to work for us and help us get um, more out of what we can do. So design automation, or in our case, we often call it EDA, electric design automation, is a key part to how we can deal with this huge problem. And the third thing I would like to point out is design reuse. It's also known as IP or intellectual property. Um, and design reuse means that if somebody already has designed something, why don't we just use it instead of trying to design everything ourselves? So that can either be going and buying something off shelf or designing it inside our company by a different team. The course uh, that we will follow has um, 10 lectures starting from this introduction through different levels of learning how to do register transfer level design with Verilog, going through logic synthesis, static timing analysis, um, moving to the physical domain and starting the back end or, or physical implementation stage, going through placement, clock tree synthesis, routing, and discussing a bit uh, IO and packaging and design for test. Um, we're going to see in this how to do these things hands on. We're going to learn some of the algorithms uh, behind it and we're going to learn a lot about how to do this correctly and how we deal with all these problems and make these amazing chips. I uh, designed this course based on a lot, lot, lot of uh, data, starting with um, stuff that I learned when I was an a back-end engineer and different things I did during my different um, degrees in academic research. Um, but there's a lot, a lot, lot of uh, stuff that I found available on the internet, starting with Rob Rutenbar's from Logic to Layout course on Coursera, which uh, I, I took a lot of uh, concepts from. Um, Nir Sever, a friend and a big technologist here in Israel, um, taught a small course when I was a, uh, when I was a graduate student, and I uh, took some stuff from him. And there are several others, of course, um, Jan Rabai's and David uh, Harris's books, and um, Cadence Support, Synopsis SolveNet, and many other um, references that you can find online. 